Good morning. What's the grossest thing that you can think of? Welcome to the Great Plains Nature Center Not So Live Facebook program. I'm recording this today on a beautiful day. I hope that you're spending some time outdoors. This was one of the recent programs I provided for Creature Feature. It was a lot of fun and interesting to find information to share with you. The program is a series of videos about the disgusting things animals do to protect themselves from predators as well as keep themselves healthier. While several of the animals included in the program are birds, I also included mammals, reptiles, and insects. The program was inspired by a children's book we had in the gift shop. So here we go. Let's find out about those gross, yucky, disgusting things animals do. The first one we have up is the American Eagle. You'll notice in the picture that the eagles have caught a catfish and they are <clears throat> preparing to devour it themselves as well as feed it to their young. Mm-mm, good. Just what a healthy eagle baby and mom and dad need to survive. You can find eagles all over the state of Kansas. Here's a map of Kansas. Some places that you might find the <clears throat> animals are up near Manhattan, around Tuttle Creek Reservoir. I've seen a pair of, uh, in that area. You might have also seen some very large nests or could see some at a Quivira National Wildlife Refuge out here west of Hutchison and a little bit south of Great Bend. You can also see <clears throat> the animals nesting perhaps at El Dorado Steak Lake near the Walnut River Park area. So those are several places that you can see them in the state. Additionally, you can <clears throat> attend some Eagle Day festivals. One is held in Lawrence at Clinton Reservoir and the numbers there have been increasing for some time or since 1989. You can also attend an Eagle Days at Milford Lake Last year, it was hosted on January 26th. It was held at the Nature Center at Milford Lake and from nine to four, and they also had guided bus tours to allow you to go and see the animals. Another place that you might look for a Eagle program would be at Chaplin Nature Center. They give guided hikes along the Nature Center trails to view the Eagles along the Arkansas River. So you might check out those three places next January to see if you can come up and find some eagles in Kansas. Our next critter is a barred owl. This video was taken in June of 2014 in Ontario, Canada. Let's see what disgusting habit this animal has.
Oh, I think he's just about ready. Num, 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 and that looks excellent for that animal. Actually, what he's doing is he is <clears throat> vomiting, upchucking the undigested parts of the animals or critters that he had eaten for his lunch. I'd like to give you a closer look at that animals. If I can get it pr to progress. To the next slide. <clears throat> at what that animal might have been eating. So give me just a second of clicking around and I'll show you some owl pellets and what you might find in them. The first one that I have here is a barred owl pellet. This was purchased commercially and was sanitized so that it could be handled well. And as you tear it into smaller pieces, you'll begin to find bones and the fur of the animals that it had digested. But the big find in this particular one is the skull of one of the rodents that it was eating. It's pretty fragile and breaks apart easily. Again, this was a purchased owl pellet, <clears throat> and you can find those online at different science centers or science websites. The next pay picture is a chart of these different kinds of animals. So if we look carefully or observe this particular skull, we can see that it has some very long teeth here in the front, common of rodents. So if I was going to decide which one it was, I would say, that it was the common rodent of what we're not quite sure, but it looks very similar to this one as far as the structure of that skull. Get it there where you can see it a little bit better. And then today, as I was cleaning our bird cages, I also found some pellets from two of our other raptors or birds of prey. The one I'm holding in my hand now is a eastern screech owl pellet. Again, if we tear it apart, I can feel the bones, well, there's a little tiny bone right there, of the animal. And that one came from the eastern screech owl. I don't very often find the skull of the mouse that we feed those animals in the pellet. The last one that I recovered today was from our American kestrel. You can see it's a little bit smaller pellet, but still has the remains of bones and things that the animal could not digest in its <clears throat> system. And now I'm going to clean my hands off. If you wanted to find owl pellets, you might search around your neighborhood. And here's the chart a little bigger so that you can see it a little better, just in case I didn't show it to you earlier in the correct frame. Here is the rodent skull that I think was most closely associated with the one that I found in the barred owl pellet. But again, I was saying, if you want to find some owl pellets to dissect that you, out in the wild, you could probably find those animal, those near a tree where you've sighted them. Probably have to go out in the late evening or <clears throat> almost a uh, complete dark in order to find maybe some nesting owls in your area. The next critter that we're going to talk about is the turkey vulture. The turkey vulture 
is one that has a number of disgusting habitat habits. This picture I took of turkey vultures was in August, probably as the turkey vultures were gathering and getting ready to migrate. Um, I took it in 2018 at Lake Scott in western Kansas. I had never seen so many turkey vultures in one place at one time. They weren't just <clears throat> lining the top of this fence or entry area. They were all along the fence posts on either side. There were maybe in the area probably a hundred turkey vultures in one place. I thought that was pretty amazing. Here is a migration map. The dark blue, you can find turkey vultures in all seasons. The reddish pink area is where they are common in breeding season. And then the pink is also a breeding area, but more uncommon to find them in that area. So as you can see, Kansas is a very popular place for the turkey vulture. But here's a video to tell you more about the disgusting habits of a turkey vulture. You've been digging around in your fridge late at night looking for a snack and come upon some leftovers in the back wondering if maybe too much time has passed, but you go for it anyway because you're hungry and lazy and cheap. Yeah, like college, all of college for me. But then by the next morning, you're all moaning and groaning and really regretting that decision to eat the slightly fuzzy burrito. You know who doesn't have that problem? Vultures. At some point in your life, you've probably come across a hunched turkey vulture digging into a nice ripe smudge of roadkill and thought, how? Can you eat that rotten, stinky meat and not get sick? How is that not killing you? The world's 23 species of vultures have evolved the ultimate freegan palate. They pretty much eat exclusively dead things with the help of their amazing digestive systems. The stomach breaks down food using gastric juices comprised mainly of hydrochloric acid to dissolve bonds and protein molecules and digestive enzymes that continue the dismantling process. The average levels of a normal human gastric system are between one and two on the pH scale. By of comparison, vinegar weighs in at about 2.4 and battery acid at about 0 0.08. But the stomach acids of some vultures comes in between 0 and 1, so corrosive that they can dissolve certain metals. Which is super cool, but unless they're trying to eat a robotic raccoon, not particularly useful. I mean, it's a bit overkill for just like dead cow stuff. But a festering carcass, as you might imagine, is a dirty place. It may still house whatever viruses, parasites, and diseases killed the thing in the first place. That's why the bird's super strong acid cocktail is a whiz at killing a whole mess of pathogens that would be lethal to lesser scavengers, from salmonella and cholera to anthrax, botulism, even rabies. In addition to laying the smack down on nasty bugs in the digestive tract and pumping blood thick with bacteria-fighting antibodies, vultures have a few more tricks up their feathered sleeves to stay healthy. Like pooping in their pants. They don't wear pants, but they do poop directly on their legs, which is a strange kind of brilliant. For one, this evaporating slurry of waste is a great way to cool down on a hot day, and for another, the whitish slop contains some of that great acid, which acts as an awesome sanitizer on legs that have been knee-deep in rot. Not only that, but the waste keeps killing pathogens in the grass around the carrion, helping to prevent the spread of disease to other animals and even to soil and water systems. So vultures are kind of like a hazmat cleanup crew. A vulture's bald head also keeps it clean since they've got to get all up in the mushy chest cavities and guts. Their heads get pretty grody. A feathered crest would house more bacteria-ridden flesh crumbs than Methuselah's beard, whereas a clean pate stays more hygienic and gets baked clean under the hot sun. Oh, and if you've heard the tale that vultures projectile vomit to protect themselves from predators, know that this is only half true. They do indeed produce an impressive hurl storm, but it probably isn't to spew rabies in coyotes' faces. Although vulture vomit may burn those unlucky enough to get splattered, it's probably more to do with the fact that they've gorged so much on meat that they're too heavy to quickly lift off and thus need to lighten the load. In any case, at that point, any potential predator would presumably think, oh, hot acid vomit, and leave the bird alone. Excellent. So anyway, next time you feel like vultures are gross, just remember that in addition to being gross, they are also really amazing. Thanks for watching this. You wasn't that yucky, but really, the turkey vulture does a great job of cleaning up the environment for us and taking care of the carrion and the dead waste that helps and helps uh, they're a natural recycler for nature. You've been digging around in your fridge late at night.
one smaller bird that digested, <clears throat> digests its meal and then throws it up for its babies is a gull. So maybe not quite as disgusting as the turkey vulture we just learned about. But the next one is on my top 10 list of <clears throat> disgusting. This is <clears throat> one about the American robin, that cute little bird that we see hopping around on the ground. Like all newborns, baby birds poop a lot. But if you peer into most species' nest, not just robins, there's little to no evidence of that poop. So where does it go? Fecal sacs, which only nestlings produce, <clears throat> will be taken away by the adults, keeping the nest clean. It's also a nutritional snack, recycling <clears throat> that material, and it's known, or a trait known, as coprophagia. But in addition to providing a nutrient, when they're carrying away the feces, they're also preventing detection by predators. And the adult bird will carry the poop in their mouths to clean the nest. So let's watch how a mother robin keeps the nest clean for her babies and protects them from predators. So that white little blob that you saw the mother picking from the nest was the fecal sac. I think we need to see that one again. Oh, there she goes. Brought some worms to those hungry babies. And now she's helping to clean the nest, those white sacks of fecal matter, or poop. She's devouring to help keep the nest clean and keep the babies <clears throat> safe from predators. Mm, definitely on my top 10 of disgusting. The next one is the honeybee, everyone's favorite snack, some honey on some biscuits or something like that, but maybe not after you see this information about what that nectar, how that nectar actually comes to be, help produce the honey. Worker bees spend their days zipping around from flower to flower, slurping up nectar, hitting up as many as 1,500 flowers each time they leave the hive. Nectar is delicious, as all bees know, but their tiny, fuzzy, stingy little bodies can't use the sucrose and nectar directly. They have to digest it first, and that's where the puking comes in. When worker bees drink nectar, some of it goes into their regular stomachs so that they can keep their energy up to forage for some more, but most of it goes into a special nectar-only storage stomach to bring back to the hive. After their bellies are full, the worker bees return to the hive to find a processor bee, a stay-at-home bee if you will, and it regurgitates the nectar into the other bee's mouth. Why, you ask in horror? Well, it's a team effort. As the worker bees fly back to the hive, enzymes produced by the processor bees begin to break down the sucrose. Once back, they pass the nectar to processor bees, who continue to break down the nectar into fructose and glucose. Quick fun fact. Bees jobs are assigned by their age. Processor bees are middle-aged bees since they have the most amount of enzymes in their stomachs, whereas old bees stop producing the enzymes as they age, which is when they become worker bees. So after about half an hour, the processor bees have broken down the nectar and turned it into honey. From there, bees puke the honey into one of those little honeycomb holes for safekeeping, that is, until bears and humans rob them. But there's one more step. Once the honey has been regurgitated into the honeycomb, it's still about 70% water. So the processor bees spend the next few days fanning the honeycomb holes with their wings until it dries out to just under 18% water. Then they secrete out wax to seal the honey in the comb. Although it's hard work, in a bee's entire life, she might make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. But boy is it tasty. Who knew there was all this chemistry in honey? What's your favorite use for honey?
So what's your favorite use for honey? While it's somewhat disgusting the way it's made, I think I'll still continue to enjoy it on a biscuit, especially a nice warm one just out of the oven. The next animal is a turtle. Did you know that they can breathe through their butts? This video talks primarily about a sea turtle, but breathing through a butt, as a turtle does, is characteristic of many aquatic turtles. Animals just so happen to keep their breathing organs inside of their cloacas, a sort of multi-purpose hole in their rear ends. But it turns out they have a very good reason for it. Take Australia's Fitzroy River Turtle, for example. It has a normal pair of lungs, but happens to like hanging out at the bottom of rivers and streams, which makes using those lungs kind of difficult. Some other animals, like frogs, solve this problem using subcutaneous respiration, where they use their skin to get oxygen from the surrounding water. But turtle skin is all scaly, or covered by a shell, so they can't use it to breathe. So, like a few other species of water-loving turtles, the Fitzroy River Turtle turtle can get oxygen using what's known as cloacal respiration, the official term for breathing out of your butt. They use cloacal bursi, two sacs inside its body on either side of the cloaca that act kind of like gills. This species of turtle is pretty good at it, getting about 70% of its oxygen just from drawing in water through its cloaca, filtering out the oxygen, and pumping it back out up to 60 times a minute. And the system has added benefits for turtles that have to hibernate for the winter. If you tried to spend a few months underwater, you would die. At most, you'd last a few minutes before you had to come up for air. Even whales can only hold their breath for about two hours, maximum. But turtles that use cloacal respiration don't really have to worry about that. In addition to helping them get oxygen underwater, it's a fantastic energy saver because breathing through your lungs is pretty challenging if you're a turtle. When most animals, including humans, take a breath, our rib cages expand. That creates a sort of vacuum in our lungs and air rushes in to equalize the pressure. Let go and the rib cage goes back to normal, forcing the air back out. The whole process doesn't use much energy. But turtles, can't do that because their shells are their rib cages and they can't really expand that way. Instead, their whole bodies have to move toward the edges of the shell to create that same negative pressure. It's a lot more work and a lot more lost energy just to breathe. Energy that a hibernating turtle can't really afford to lose. So, cloacal respiration may be kind of a gross way to get air, but it's an energy efficient one. Well, turtles breathing through their butts. Maybe not quite as disgusting as some of the other ideas, but helps them to survive, particularly through a winter season. Animals just so happen to keep their breathing. The next one is the mountain lion. In this one, we'll just get a brief glimpse of a mother licking her baby's butts to help them to poop and pee. And then mom will sometimes eat the waste. The mountain lion in Kansas <clears throat> is reported to be seen on many occasions, but only um, are very few confirmations. The first confirmed mountain lion in Kansas in modern times was shot and killed in 2007 in Barber County in South Central, uh, in South Central Kansas. Prior to 2007, the last mountain lion documented in Kansas was killed in 1904 in Ellis County. The 21st and last confirmation occurred in January of 2019 in Rooks County with a 114 pound male that was killed by a group of upland bird hunters. It was the second that has been killed since 2007. So again, very few confirmed sightings in Kansas. But here's some video that shows you the playful cubs of a mountain lion.
So that was the mountain lion. And although the video didn't depict <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier as the mom licking their butts to get them to poop and pee and then eating it, still gave you an, a representation a little bit of the life of the mountain lion. The next one is an animal that is more common to Kansas. In fact, I hear them and have seen them in my backyard. I live just a little bit north of Wichita, around uh, 85th and uh, Broadway. So quite often have seen coyotes in the area, most often in the late evening or right before it's getting dark. But my dogs think that they're around all the time. But what coyotes are known for is to urinate to mark their territory, and they will also use their scat or their feces in more heavily used areas, kind of a keep out sign. Um, we see evidence near my home on many occasions. So here is an example of the coyote. Maybe not quite as disgusting as some of the other examples either. The last one <clears throat> is a rabbit. While this is just a pet rabbit or a pet rabbit in captivity, you would also find rabbits doing this in the wild as well. The rabbits have two different kinds of dropping. Cecotropes that are eaten for the nutrients are the one that probably would be the yuckiest to us but the animals are staying healthier and protecting themselves if they were in the wild from predators. Here's our rabbit, Nathan, also known as Ranger Rabbit. He's a tripod, he only has three legs. He's missing his back left leg. It makes it difficult for him to get to his cecotropes. We have him here in a cage works cage and uh, as you can see here, it's just uh, like a wire mesh. No, no, not a wire mesh. I, I don't want to use that word because it's not exactly that. But as you can see, we also have mighty mats there. That's that uh, plastic thing you see over the, the wire. So that way uh, it's more comfortable for him. So I'm going to go ahead and harvest his cecotrope. See, I can just pull out this tray. Let me back off the camera here. There we go. So that's a tray right here. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and harvest his cecotropes here. There's a cluster right there. See that shiny cluster right there? It looks like a cluster of miniature grapes, I guess. <clears throat> and there's another shiny one here. Let's see if I can find it. There we go, right there. See how shiny that is? Oops, can't focus. There we go. And there's probably more inside the uh, tray. I just gotta go harvest, harvest them and uh, put it on a tray for him and uh, watch him eat it. This is our rabbit, Nathan, also known as Ranger Rabbit. This is a whole plate full of cecotropes that he outputted. Let's see if he eats it all. You want this boy? Here boy. Let's take that out of your mouth. Here, here. Here you go. Oh my gosh, he's going to town on this. I can't believe you really like that. Oh boy. Yum, yum. What a good boy. Oh boy, I cannot believe he's eating all that.
Oh, what a cute little bunny enjoying his secotropes. Well, here's our that's rabbit the last Nathan, also known as Ranger. <clears throat> the ex disgusting, yucky things that I could think of. And actually, I think that I will move the American Robin or birds in general to the top of my list as the most disgusting. Well, again, I mentioned that the inspiration for this program was a book that I found in the Great Plains Nature Center gift shop called Nature's Yucky. And it includes other animals from around the world, not just ones that you would normally find in Kansas. I hope you'll get outside on this great day and enjoy the weather and that we have some wonderful spring days ahead of us. Looking forward to having you at the Nature Center again soon. Don't know when that will be, but we hope you'll be here soon. Thanks.